Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. While well, the New Year's kisses are still being exchanged across the aisle. <laughs> Welcome to the first event of 2015 of the John Adams Institute. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm the proud director of this institute, which I think is just about the best thing since sliced bread. We have with us this evening Jennifer Lawless, professor of government at American University in Washington, and with her as moderator, Paul Brill, whom I'm sure all of you know as uh, the former correspondent for the US for the Volkskrant. We had dinner together before this, and I can promise you that this is going to be a really interesting evening, which will probably leave you knowledgeable, but maybe not uplifted. <laughs> not everything that Jennifer has to say is very optimistic, but it's all really interesting, and she's a great speaker, so I think we're gonna have a really interesting evening in this fantastic location, the Achnita Kapel pretty much the birthplace of the University of Amsterdam. Two of the founders of Amsterdam's famous uh, gymnasiums, the schools, taught here, including Barleus. And I was told that this wonderful collection of paintings on the walls, make sure to look around you, all of them are insured, and the least amount for which one of them insured is 1.2 million. So, I hope you feel very pampered now. <laughs> There are a couple of people I'd like to thank. I'd like to thank the U.S. Embassy. Two of the colleagues are here this evening. No, more, three, four, five. Oh, how many? Seven or eight. Incognito for me, I still have some people to meet. Uh, thank you very much for making this happen. Uh, it's a, a, a great collaboration and I think we're going to be Really uh, glad of Jennifer's insights into what the midterm elections have meant for the U.S. and how to go from here, and also what uh, what the situation is now with women in politics. One of the striking things I read on her site after the elections was that the midterm elections were hailed as being an important moment in politics because women had now finally breached the three-digit number in the legislature, 100 women, until you read that just before the midterm elections, there were 99. <laughs> so what does this really mean? We'll know at the end of the evening. I also want to point out to you the beautiful publication that my colleague Yara Daus, our events coordinator, has put together with the six blogs that were written for us, including by Paul Brill, about the midterm elections under the title A Nation Torn. They're all on our site. It's uh, now been, uh, uh, Yara created a lovely e-publication which you can download and send on to your friends as uh, some insights into the subject of this evening. I also want to introduce to you two of our board members who have joined us this evening, Thuis Volkering. Thuis, could you stand up? Thuis Volkering and Martina Bijkerk. Martina? Yes. Thank you for joining us here this evening. And if you'd like to know more about the John Adams Institute and what you can do to help us and what you would like us to do to interest you, we'd be happy to talk. And I'd also like to thank uh, a group of new visitors this evening, students Amerikanistik at the university. There are at least six or seven of you, if I'm not mistaken. Nine. Nine, yay! Thanks for joining us. We're glad that you're here and hope that you'll come back often. And thanks to our new intern, René de Groot. René, stand up. René, thank you for extending the invitation to your fellow students and for uh, making this happen. And Renee will be helping us in the coming months with everything that the John Adam does. Uh, for now, I would like to leave you with this, and you'll see me at the end for closing remarks and announcement of our upcoming event. Thanks a lot. I'd like to hand over the floor to Paul Brill. I knew I was forgetting something to tell you that Paul's introduction will be on our site tomorrow and then you can reread it and think about it at your leisure. Paul. Uh, thank you, Tracy, and good evening. Um, and uh, if you're Dutch, 
thank you for preferring an American politics over Dutch politics because at this very moment uh, a parliamentary debate is going on about Paris and its aftermath. But we'll make it worthwhile, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, one of my favorite characters in the history of American politics is Claire Booth Luce, a fascinating personality. She was first and foremost a writer, and as a young woman she practiced journalism, wrote essays, drama, and film scenarios. But in 1942, she entered politics and was elected as a Republican to represent the 4th District of Connecticut in the U.S. Congress. Later in life, in the 50s, she would become the first female ambassador of the United States. Although her political convictions were a little too conservative for my taste, she was undoubtedly a bright and forceful presence on the political scene. She was witty. She was sharp-toned, and as a speaker, she knew how to engage an audience. She authored several famous catchwords and one-liners. Although she supported wholeheartedly the war effort, she was very critical of the idealistic plans that were developed within the Roosevelt administration for the post-war order. Plans which she denounced repeatedly and for which she coined a term that would stick for a long time, globaloni. And when a Republican senator switched to the Democratic Party, she quipped, whenever a Republican leaves one side of the aisle and goes to the other, it raises the IQ of both parties. <laughs> there are two reasons uh, for me to evoke the life and career of Claire Booth Luce this evening. The first reason is to remind all of us, you and me, <laughs> that combativeness and partisanship have always been part of the American political scene. Faced with the polarization that has been such a prominent feature of Washington over the past 20 years, and certainly during Barack Obama's presidency, we tend to think that it is a, new, a relatively new phenomenon or that it has never had such an overwhelming impact. But is that really true? That is, I hope, one of the questions that will be dealt with by our guest speaker. More specifically, what can we expect from Congress now that the Republicans control both houses of the, on Capitol Hill? Will there be more confrontation with the White House? Will there be even more deadlock? Or will both the White House and the, the GOP rest, um, show more restraint as they prepare for the next presidential elections. And by the way, which party is best positioned for the 2016 campaign? The second reason for mentioning Claire Booth Luce is that, well, she's a woman, and may be considered, considered as one of the female pioneers of American politics. The participation of women in politics is the second topic of this evening. There may be more, but at least this is one. The question is, is gender still a major factor in campaigns and elections? Why does the number of women who hold elected office in the United States remain relatively low? Our guest this evening is highly qualified to give us a better insight on both accounts. Professor Jennifer Lawless is widely recognized, uh, a widely recognized expert on women's involvement in politics. She has tried it herself. Her uh, research has appeared in numerous academic journals. She is the author of a book called Becoming a Candidate, Political Ambition and the Decision to Run for Office. And she is the co-author of another book, It Still Takes a Candidate, Why Women Don't Run for Office. I think both books are for sale downstairs. She is a professor at the School for Public Affairs at the American University in Washington, DC, where she is the director of the Women and Politics Institute. So please welcome Jennifer Lawless. Thank you. I'm also significantly shorter than everyone else who was up here. Um, I, I ran for Congress in 2006, and my most important rule was never to be at a podium because it's just me and a head. Um, but I'll sit at the table later. 
Uh, it is an honor to be here tonight, and I can officially say that this is the most beautiful room I've ever spoken in, so thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Um, I thought that what I would do is just give you five basic observations about the 2014 midterms and some of the broader trends that they speak to about American politics and the future of American politics. And then that'll take about 20 minutes or so. And then during the discussion and the questions, I'll get to any details that you're interested in or any topics that I don't cover. But I could stand here and talk for seven years about what happened in 2014, so I wanted to give myself a clear limit. Okay, number one, women. It is true that we reached this threshold. There are now, in the House and Senate combined, 103 women serving in the United States national government. This was, as we've heard already, heralded as a major, major milestone that was reached. And symbolically, it was. It was the first time we cracked into the triple digits. Granted, we were at 99 before this, but still, this matters a lot. It wasn't only that we cracked into the triple digits that was important. There were other milestones that were broken for women this election cycle. Iowa sent its first female senator to Washington. Never before had they had any woman in their congressional delegation. I'm apparently also speaking too quickly. I will slow down. Um, Joni Ernst, however, was elected as a Republican, and she is now in the U.S. Senate. West Virginia sent its first female senator to Washington as well. And that was actually a race that pitted a female Republican against a female Democrat. So there was no question that that was an advance. Shelley Moore Capito is now the Republican senator from West Virginia. Rhode Island, where, I'm, where I worked for several years, where I ran for Congress, is a very progressive state. But never before had they elected a woman governor. This time they did. Gina Raimondo, a Democrat, is now serving as the state's first female governor. Mia Love from Utah was elected the first African-American female Republican to the U.S. House of Representatives. And the other big milestone was in upstate New York, where Elise Stefanik, also a Republican, became the youngest woman to ever serve in the House of Representatives. She's 30. So these five, in, these five cases, coupled with cracking this 100 mark, made the media very, very happy and excited and thought that things were terrific. Now, you've probably heard that there are some people who are glasses half full and there are others who are glasses half empty. I'm the glasses entirely empty all the time. So let me put these numbers into perspective for you. When this new, very diverse, very amazing Congress convened last week, 80% of the members of the U.S. Senate were men. 81% of the members of the U.S. House of Representatives were men. 45 of the 50 states have male governors. 75% of state legislators across the country are men. 76% of statewide elected officials across the country are men. And if we look at the 100 largest cities, 92 of them have male mayors. It gets worse. The U.S. currently ranks 100th globally in the percentage of women in the national legislature. When I started doing this research in 1999 as a graduate student, we ranked 57th. So in the last 15 or 16 years, the rest of the world has sort of caught on a little bit, maybe, to the importance of women in politics. Um, we haven't. And we've also hit a plateau internally in that for the last 18 years, the number and percentage of women serving in the state legislatures have been roughly the same. And this remarkable increase we saw this time around for the U.S. Congress amounts to less than a 1% net increase. Given that in 2010, we actually saw a net decrease, all this has really done is get us back on track. So I'd argue that when we're talking about how women did and how women were a major narrative and a major part of the 2014 election cycle, it's important not to diminish some of these famous firsts and the novelty of some of the successes that actually did ensue. But it's important to put them in a broader context. And that context is that US politics remains the United States of men. Now, this is not to say that there is bias against female candidates. And this is one of the most important points that I want to make. When women run for office, they do just as well as men. Female incumbents win at equal rates as male incumbents. Female challengers lose at equal rates as male challengers. 
and women and men competing for open seats do equally as well. This is true in primaries and in general elections, and this is true in both the Democratic and the Republican Party. So there doesn't seem to be a problem in terms of voters voting for women. There's evidence to suggest that donors are just as likely to give to women. And some new research that I've been conducting with a colleague at George Washington University suggests that the media, at least in congressional elections, cover women and men the same, not only in terms of the volume of the coverage, but also the substance of that coverage. This probably flies in the face of what you think of when you think about some high-profile examples of bias or sexism or Hillary Clinton. But not everyone is Hillary Clinton, and most people are not, and most people don't endure that kind of time on the campaign trail. And so what we argue is that the problem is that women aren't running for office in the first place. It's a supply problem. It's not a demand problem. A supply problem is difficult to fix, but if we can encourage more women to get involved in politics, we might see bigger change. We can't really be surprised that the 2014 election cycles amounted in only less than a 1% increase in the number of women serving, when women only competed for about one-third of the seats overall. And many of them were running against incumbents. They were equally likely to be defeated as men running against incumbents. But when we're talking about a small number of people, it's very difficult for there to be any kind of jolt to the system. So the good news about women in 2014 were there were some milestones achieved that never before had been met. And yet one more time, we had an election cycle where there was no evidence of overt bias against women on election day or leading up to election day, at least when you look at them systematically. The bad news is there was not a record number of female candidates. There were no indicators that the future was going to look any different than the past, at least in terms of the raw numbers of women running and serving. So women, that's point one. Point two, competitiveness. There are no competitive elections anymore in the United States. We can tell you before the election, years before the election, I can tell you right now about how 90% of the congressional districts in the 2016 races will play out. And it doesn't matter who the candidates are. We have such highly polarized politics in the United States today that whether a candidate has a D for Democrat or an R for Republican in front of his or her name tells us pretty much all we need to know about whether that candidate is going to win or lose in almost every congressional district in the country. Charlie Cook runs something called the Cook Political Report. Some of you are probably familiar with this. And in every election cycle, he classifies races as safe for the Democrat, safe for the Republican, leaning Democratic, leaning Republican, or truly competitive, a toss-up race. What's interesting here is that who the candidate is is irrelevant. All of these assessments are made exclusively on the party distribution of voters in a district and the party of the candidate competing, whether that candidate has electoral experience. In 2014, out of the 435 congressional districts across the United States, he rated only 17 of them as toss-up districts. Another 10 or 12 were rated as leaning, and they could have gone either way. In this election cycle, they all went for the Republicans. All the toss-up districts did too. Um, but there was just not that much fertile playing ground, right? The electoral playing field where there was real competition was just not that big. So we hear about how this was a crazy election cycle, how there were these fundamental shifts. There were fundamental shifts in a handful of districts that quite frankly were represented by people of the wrong party. This election cycle was just the final sorting and the pieces finally falling where they were supposed to so that the representative of the district actually matched the majority party of the constituents in that district. Now, this is important for two reasons. The first is, next time around, there will probably be even fewer of these districts because more of these districts are now correctly aligned between the voters and the party of the representative. If we look back to 2010, for example, about 46 districts were deemed toss-ups. So there were more of them. They got sorted out. This time around, we had about 17 left. This is important because what this means is that as the Democratic Party is becoming more and more Democratic and the Republican Party is becoming more and more Republican, 
there are just not that many opportunities for electoral competition. What that also means is the incumbency advantage, even though everybody hates Congress, everybody hates everybody's other, everybody else's member of Congress, people even don't like their own incumbents anymore, they still get elected. They run and they seek re-election at very, very high rates, consistently above 90%. And even in anti-incumbency years like this one, they win re-election at far above a rate of 90%. People were asked, there were national polls one of my favorite questions was, if you could get rid of the entire Congress and we could choose a random sample of 435 Americans to govern instead, do you think they would do a better job? 50% of Americans said yes. Another question, would you vote to defeat every single member of Congress, including your own incumbent, if you could on your ballot? Two-thirds of Americans said yes. These are the same people who, by the way, then voted for their own incumbents, right? Four were defeated in primaries, for example. Now, what this means for congressional elections and electoral politics is that the debate and the discussion becomes highly nationalized. It's not about what's actually happening in your district anymore. It's about, is Barack Obama popular? Is, are the Republicans moving the country in the direction that you want? And are your national impressions of the Democratic and the Republican Party in sync with the per people running in your district? And that's how you make your choice. It used to be the case that a Republican from New York or from Rhode Island or from Massachusetts could get elected. That's no longer the case. Because Democrats running in those districts represent the Democratic name brand nationally. And Republicans running in those districts represent the Republican name brand nationally. So a Republican who cares about his Democratic constituents and lives in a Democratic district, but still casts a vote for a Speaker of the House who's a Republican, is a highly undesirable proposition. And so this lack of competitiveness has made very, very few districts garner any kind of attention or interest um, in politics overall. Number three, this is also bad news, governing. Don't expect to see any. There are a few reasons why things are not going to get any better in the next two years as far as, I don't know, producing any type of legislation is concerned. Um, the first is that we do not have a filibuster-proof Senate. So the Democrats lost control of the Senate, but the Republicans didn't gain enough seats to actually be able to do anything in the Senate. Coupled with a Democrat in the White House, the political tide is not going to look that much different than it did heading into the election. More bills will hit Barack Obama's desk, but he also doesn't need to worry about getting reelected, so chances are more bills will be vetoed by Barack Obama as well. Um, but what complicates governing even more is that several Republican senators have demonstrated presidential ambition for 2016. And so people like Ted Cruz from Texas, Marco Rubio from Florida, Rand Paul from Kentucky, have absolutely no interest whatsoever in helping their competitive colleagues who are also considering running accomplish anything. And they have no incentive to help the president accomplish anything because they can already envision the ads that show that they're just basically promoting Barack Obama's agenda. And so we saw this in 2000, and, I'm sorry, we saw this between 2006 and 2008 when several Democratic senators decided that they were going to run for president. Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, Chris Dodd. We saw that those Democrats did not necessarily put legislating and their role in the Senate ahead of their own presidential campaigns. And that makes governing quite different and difficult. And so as long as that becomes the pool of potential candidates, and as long as those people are interested in running for office in the future, it's unlikely that the shift in power coupled with their own aspirations will allow for there to be much more progress or that much more legislation than what we've seen this far. And this has important implications, and this leads to point four. We should expect public opinion toward political institutions in the United States to continue to go down. Um, one of my other favorite polls was conducted by public policy polling. And every year they do a poll that I think is just so amusing. They ask people in a series of about 30 head-to-head matchups 
whether they think Congress or some other very unpopular entity is more favorable or more appealing. This year, head lice beat out Congress, colonoscopies beat out Congress, telemarketers were more popular than Congress. In fact, the only things that were less popular than Congress were North Korea, meth labs, which I was quite surprised by because Breaking Bad in the United States really has taken on a life of its own, and I thought that would really heighten the interest in meth, but fortunately, not yet. And playground bullies were less favorable than Congress. But Congress should not be that excited because several of the margins were quite close. Um, congressional approval hit an all-time low. It actually sunk to the single digits. Senator John McCain joked that congressional approval, the people approving of Congress, are down to paid staffers and family members of the members themselves. And frankly, I, I mean, if you do the math, he's not that far off the mark. So what this means is that we have a new body of elected officials, but levels of disillusionment, general patterns of dysfunction, and a general sense of ineffectiveness are probably not going anywhere. We've already seen the beginnings of what look to be some pretty bad fights. And what happens with the way that the institutional structures are set up are that pretty bad fights don't result in pretty bad compromises. They just result in nothing. They result in gridlock. They result in stymied policies. They result in nominations never going anywhere. Now, the good news is that's pretty much the status quo. So it's not like this is going to be a shift that we all have to become accustomed to. The bad news is that's not really what you think about when you think of an ideal form of government and an opportunity to move the country forward. And then my fifth piece of bad news is that, I'm, I promise to end on a positive note, though. My, I have to think of one while I'm talking. Um, my fifth piece of bad news is that I'm not convinced that the voters are that much better. And let me explain why. There is a major disconnect between the party that the voters vote for and the elected officials they choose and their policy preferences. So in this election cycle, in several states, different ballot initiatives allowed voters to cast ballots indicating whether they favored or opposed particular policies. Everywhere it was on the ballot, the use of recreational marijuana or medical marijuana passed. Everywhere it was on the ballot, restrictions curtailing a woman's right to choose and abortion access failed. Everywhere they were on the ballot, marriage equality initiatives passed, right to die initiatives passed. So when, basically, without fail, across the entire country, from the right to choose, to marriage equality, to environmental regulation, when voters had a choice, they voted in the more progressive, more liberal, more democratic uh, direction. Those same voters, without fail, whenever they had a choice to elect a Republican or a Democratic member of Congress or U.S. Senator voted for the Republican. So what they've done is they've elected people that are in no way favorable toward the policies that they also support. And so what this means is we have a partisan legislature, we have a very partisan Congress, and we have a more moderate public than their elected officials are. So they're forced to choose between candidates that are more extreme than they are. This has probably always been the case, but with fewer competitive elections, the implications are, in a lot of ways, exacerbated. And so these people who favor more progressive policies are the very same people who ushered in a GOP majority in the U.S. Senate. And if you tell them this, I guarantee they will say what? So, you know, the level of attention and the level of detail that uh, consumes most Americans is not on the political front. Now, the good news, if there's any good news, is that there's a 2016 election around the corner. And there are some very important opportunities. And let me just highlight a few of them before I close. The first is that we're going to have a new president. And so to the extent that for the last eight years, or six years, Barack Obama has been a foil for the Republicans and has been an opportunity for the Republicans to um, basically counter themselves against across the board, 
that's going to no longer be the case. Both the Democrats and the Republicans are going to have to lay out some vision of their own for moving forward. Now, how creative and different that vision will be obviously depends at least in part on the candidates. And when we think about a Bush-Clinton presidential campaign and presidential election, we might not immediately think, oh, well, that's something new. But Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton are, in fact, well, one of, well, I mean, new to presidential politics, sort of. Um, you know, it's likely that if she runs, and my prediction is that she will, she will easily garner the nomination. And we don't know how she would be in a general election. So in a lot of ways, that's new. And on the Republican side of the aisle, there are demographic trends and shifts that very, very much favor the Democrats. Part of the reason the Republicans did so well in the congressional elections is because they did not have to deal with a national election electorate. So when there's a presidential election, the voters who turn out are a little poorer, a little younger, and a little darker. And those demographics favor Democratic candidates. The Republicans have spent quite a bit of time figuring out how to court the Latino vote, figuring out how to mitigate the race gap in terms of African-American support for the Democrats. And the only way that they can win elections at the presidential level is to make some progress there. So whether the parties want to or not, they're going to have to generate a vision, and that vision is going to, in some way, have to demonstrate a commitment to inclusivity or diversity. They're going to do it in different ways, but neither can win an election without actual attention to these kinds of important topics. The other piece of good news is that in presidential elections, more people actually follow what's going on. And so the disconnects that we see between policy and party at the congressional level during midterm elections don't play out as strongly in presidential elections. So for progressive ballot initiatives, that's obviously good news, but it's probably also good news for Democratic candidates that didn't pull it out this time because the ballot initiative wasn't enough to get them over the 50% plus one, but a favorable Democratic presidential candidate might be what it takes. And so my overall point would be that for the next two years, politics is going to look very much like it did for the last two years. But the main focus for the next two years is also going to be 2016 forward. And there, if we have candidates who really are committed to it, I think that we could maybe break this impasse and not only get something done, but maybe turn people a little bit more back on to politics in the political arena. So that's my very glasses entirely empty view. And now I'm done. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's start a conversation about your five points. Uh, but first let me say to the audience, I'd, I'd like to do this informally, so whenever you feel the urge of asking a question, don't wait, raise your hand and I'll try to acknowledge you. Oh, there is already one. Uh, I, I've made this promise too, too soon, I guess. But go ahead, sir. I'm Bob Brager. I'm from Democrats Abroad. We represent the approximately six million Americans outside the United States in, the Democratic, in their participation in the Democratic Party. Two things occurred in the last election that are very difficult. One is the non-competitiveness that you referred to. This is the result of brutal gerrymandering which I'll explain for those here is... Wait, wait, you're going to hold a speech. No, I'm not. Okay. Do you mind? Thank you. Is there any traction for... Uh, is there any traction for a movement to, cause, to challenge gerrymandering as unconstitutional, as a reduction of the vote of voters? And I do have one other question, if I may. May I ask another question as well? The other thing that happened in this election that was dismaying to Americans abroad was the distance that Democratic candidates took from Barack Obama. We just didn't understand it. And it's going to be devastating for getting those voters to vote in 2016. 
because it, it cast us as, as opportunists. Can you explain to us why that happened and how we can answer the electorate in 2016? Thank you. I, oh, this is on. Right. Okay. Um, so let me speak to the second question first. The Democrats who were distancing themselves from Barack Obama were almost entirely running in districts where they either had very, very red districts or they were running in very, very red states. So Alison Lundgren Grimes, for example, who refused to say whether she voted for Barack Obama, she was the Democratic candidate running against Mitch McConnell in Kentucky, made a major mistake in terms of strategy and how she answered that question. But if she would not have distanced herself from Barack Obama, I don't think she would have even received the 40% of the vote that she received. She outperformed the Democratic um, vote share in that, in that state. Michelle Nunn in Georgia, very similarly. She was a competitive Democratic candidate in a very red state. The only way that she was going to win was to get Republicans and independents to vote for her. And to do that, distancing herself from Barack Obama made sense. If you looked at the safer seats where there were Democrats up, they had no problem campaigning with Obama. They had no problem touting his successes. They didn't even necessarily have a problem highlighting Obamacare. The issue was that if they would have highlighted Barack Obama's record, it would not have been believable in a lot of these red states. Now, that's not to say that some of his accomplishments and his legislative record aren't going to be vital for Democrats to highlight and the role they played in allowing these things to pass in 2016. But the geography and the seats that were up in the Senate in 2014 were terrible for the Democrats in general. And many of them were running in districts where unless there was a completely favorable Democratic tide, nothing they did would have actually worked. The gerrymandering point is an excellent one, right? Redistricting has generated a set of circumstances whereby Republicans live together and Democrats live together. And if they don't actually live together, no problem. We'll generate a district that looks completely ridiculous where one half of a highway is one district and the other half is another so that we can cluster Democrats and Republicans so that these are not competitive districts. There has been research on different redistricting plans and whether the state legislature coming up with a plan itself versus hiring a bipartisan or nonpartisan electoral commission to come up with the plan matters. And it's true that when there's a nonpartisan commission involved, it's a little bit better. But it's up to the state legislatures to decide how they want to proceed with redistricting. And as long as our state legislatures are also becoming increasingly polarized, and they are, there's very little political incentive for them to say, oh, let's have better districts that are more competitive. These districts work just fine for them, and they're the ones that are now making these decisions. That's why I also don't have much faith in campaign finance reform ever passing. It's predicated on incumbents for whom the system is working just fine, saying, no, 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 let's make it more difficult for me to raise money. No, 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 I want to return that billion dollar check, right? And so the way that the political system works just creates disincentives for the normatively attractive changes we might want to see. Okay, thank you. Let's, let's talk about uh, women in politics for, for a few minutes and get that out of the way, sort of. Um, you started with... It's all about women in politics. <laughs> you started with pointing out that... Um, um, in, in spite of the fact that so few women uh, uh, were added to the, to the number of women in, uh, in, on Capitol Hill, that there were at least five milestones, and you mentioned them, all of them. Um, it made me think, or it su suggested to me, that uh, maybe specifics are more important than numbers. And if we put it in a broader light, um, let's not forget the three top officials in the White House in charge of national security are women. The Secretary of Defense could have been a woman. Um, the next president may very well be a woman. So maybe the situation is not that bleak at all. So that's my biggest fear. What you just described is how the media, no offense, will cover a Hillary Clinton victory, right? We will no longer be able to complain or fetch about anything because, what are you talking about? There's a woman in the, pre there was a woman in the White House. And so, 
what I think we need to talk about is the importance symbolically of having more women involved in positions of power, but also whether it matters substantively. Symbolically, we've reached the point where when you look at the New York Times, when you look at the front cover and there, you look above the fold and there's a political picture summarizing what happened on Capitol Hill that day, sometimes there will be no women in that photo and sometimes there will be one woman in that photo. When Barack Obama signed the executive order closing Guantanamo Bay, I'm talking about the one in 2009 that did not close Guantanamo Bay, there was this great photo that was above the fold in both the New York Times and the Washington Post, and it was Barack Obama surrounded by only smiling white middle-aged men. They're very happy about this. A few years back, when President Bush was signing the partial birth abortion ban, he was also above the fold, smiling as he signed this, um, as he signed this bill, surrounded by smiling white middle-aged men only. And as long as that's the face of American politics that people see, I think it suggests that we're not very inclusive. Now, that's not to say that there aren't important women serving in important positions of political power, but the overall face of American politics is still male. So the two distinctions here are that first, it's important that a woman achieves success in every single position just so we know that she can. Breaking any glass ceiling and any barrier is vital. But just because she has doesn't mean that 20% female elected officials overall squares with a 52% female US population. Substantively, I'm not that convinced that it matters. One of the implications and consequences of increased party polarization is that the D or the R in front of your name is far more predictive of how you're going to vote than whether you have an X or a Y chromosome. And so there is no evidence to suggest anymore that women who are elected and serve are any more unlikely or likely than their Democratic or Republican counterparts to cast a different set of votes. Republican women and Republican men are indistinguishable in how they vote. Democratic women and Democratic men are indistinguishable in terms of how they vote. And so we've reached the point now where substantively, Men can represent women, women can represent men. It's more the symbolic and the numeric representation that still signals that something's just not exactly right about US politics. I, I would say just one more question. I would say that at least Michelle Bachmann is a person that really stands out from everybody. But anyway, you, you, you said that uh, the problem for women is not to get elected. The problem is it's a supply problem. So what's holding women back? So this, you can read about more fully in my book, It Still Takes a Candidate, Why Women Don't Run for Office, available downstairs afterward. Um, but I'll give you a sneak preview. I, I should also note, this is a little bit self-deprecating, but when I ran for Congress, um, the first edition of the book had just come out, and so my campaign manager, we, we were at a meeting, and he gave the book to some of the people and told them that it's a sure cure for insomnia. Um, anyway, it's a little boring, it's a little academic -y, but just... Read it anyway and buy it. Um, so, so what we did in this research was we were interested in why women don't run for office. All of the studies about political ambition and why women don't run for office before our research had always been based on women who had run for office. Right? So they would ask female candidates and female elected officials, why did you run? Was it easy? Was it hard? What obstacles did you face? Why do you think other women don't run? The problem, of course, is that all of these people had political ambition and ran. So they're not necessarily the best group of people to shed light on why women don't run. So what we did in 2001, and then again in 2008, and then again in 2011, was survey a national sample of what we call potential candidates. So these are lawyers, business leaders, educators, and political activists. These are the four professions that are most likely to lead to a political career for both women and men and Democrats and Republicans. And so we did these national surveys of an equal number of women and men in these professions. And we found that men were about a third more likely than women ever to even think about running for office. Among those who thought about it, men were about a third more likely than women actually to run. And so even though in our data, women and men were equally likely to win their elections. 
And even though we started out with an equal number of women and men nationally, we wound up with about twice as many women than men holding these positions because of this winnowing process. And the reason they weren't considering running or running was twofold. The first was that no one was telling them to run. One of the biggest predictors of whether a man or a woman gives serious thought to throwing his or her hat into the ring is whether anybody ever suggested it. And women were a third less likely than men to receive the suggestion to run from anyone, whether it be a party leader, an elected official, a political activist, or even a family member, colleague, or friend. They were just as receptive to the suggestion when they got it. They were just far less likely to get it. The second barrier had to do with their self-perceived qualifications. So on paper, if I showed you these women and men's resumes, you would not be able to tell them apart. They had the same professional experiences, same educational experiences. But when we asked them, do you think you're qualified to run for office? 60% of men and only about 40% of women said yes. But it gets worse. Women who don't think they're qualified to run for office don't even think about running for office. Men who check off the little bubble that says, no, I'm not at all qualified to run, still have a 50% chance of giving it serious thought. You're all now thinking of unqualified men in office, probably. And so whether women are underestimating their qualifications or whether men are overestimating theirs is in a lot of ways a topic for a different day. The point is that this perceptual gap exists and it drives actual behavior. What we found was that women felt they had to be twice as good to get half as far because they perceived bias. They didn't believe that voters would vote for women. They didn't believe that donors would give to women. They didn't believe that the media covered women fairly. So as long as those perceptions drive behavior and no one knows about the political reality of an overall electoral playing field that's actually better than most of us realize, it's hard to figure out how to close that gap. I saw a hand. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, legacy and dynasty uh, politicians. Why don't we see any daughters and nieces running the way we see sons and nephews? We do. So Michelle Nunn, who ran in Georgia this time around, for example, was, she lost, but her father was the senator from Georgia. Mary Landrieu, who was a senator from Louisiana for quite some time, lost, but she was the daughter of Moon Landrieu, who was a very famous mayor in New Orleans. Um, Nancy Pelosi was the daughter of Tom D'Alessandro, who is a great party leader in Maryland. Um, and the list goes on and on. What happens is that women are just still only a fraction of the candidates and elected officials. So although they're no less likely proportionally to come from those kinds of political families, there are just far fewer of them out there. But if I were to go out on a limb, I would bet that, you know, guessing about Chelsea Clinton's political future is not far off. And she's the next obvious child of a dynasty that, um, you know, we'll probably see. Okay. Another question here. Uh, I was just wondering, hasn't it got something to do with actually the perception of women themselves as well? Because... Recently at my work, we had a uh, survey, and then it turned out in the results that even women have a slight preference for a male manager as a boss. And uh, we had some other surveys, and it actually all confirmed everything you just said. So shouldn't it, this be, uh, be a more broadened society thing than just politics? Yes. So let me respond with two pieces of information. Um, the first is, for a long time, there was a tendency to blame female voters for not embracing female candidates and to blame female candidates for not embracing and supporting one another. Once political scientists started analyzing the data, there was no evidence for that anymore. It turns out that about 50% of voters do have what we call a baseline gender preference, but women's baseline preference is to prefer a woman, and men's baseline preference is to prefer a man. The other 50% don't factor that in at all. And because women are a greater proportion in the electorate, that baseline preference actually winds up helping female candidates. But the second point, and this is really important, has to do with the kinds of perceptions that are relevant not only in politics, but in the world. And that's where these self-doubts probably come from. Because 
they're not actually relevant in politics. So it's women's experiences in these other realms that are probably shaping their attitudes toward what it would be like when they ran for office. And particularly important here is the idea that when we ask people, well, have you experienced sexism or discrimination? It's those kinds of attitudes that we think probably drive how bad they think it is for women in politics, not whether they've seen women in politics experience sexism or discrimination. So our own experiences shape everything. What's particularly interesting about our results, though, is that our sample and all of these thousands of people were lawyers, business leaders, professors, and activists. So these are four very male-dominated professions where these women have already demonstrated ambition to succeed. So for them, politics just seemed so far removed from that. And that was what was somewhat surprising to us. They've already trumped perceptions of bias in male-dominated environments. And, and so that's what really, I think, merits additional looking into and why we think that the way that the media cover candidates or the way voters respond, we need to get that information out there. Okay, thank you. One more question about this issue. I was just wondering how the parties react to these data, especially progressive party. I'm sorry. How, how do the parties um, react to this data, um, especially a, a progressive party? Um, do they reach out more to women or to the, to the four um, positions these women might have? So that's a great question. When we've conducted all of these studies, one of the first things that we do um, is write sort of a user-friendly policy report that summarizes these data. And then we send them to every member of Congress. We send them to the party leaders, both Democratic and Republican, in all 50 states. We send them to local party officials that we can identify. So we send out thousands of these to say, look, there's no bias against women candidates. Women are not running. You are well situated to recruit them. When you recruit them, they run. Please save the world. <laughs> and without fail now, for almost 15 years, we get many, many invitations to come speak to organizations. We get many, many emails from people saying, thank you so much, we're going to use this in our trainings. We get many, many um, letters telling us that this was new information and everybody's so grateful for it. And I think 100% of that correspondence has come from Democrats. And so the Democratic Party is far more aware of and receptive to opportunities to close this recruitment gap because they want to be the party that is doing better for women. But they have to do so little to be that party that they're not engaging in these big widespread initiatives. They have to do this much and they're better than the Republicans as far as women are concerned. So there's just not the kind of incentive that's required for the parties to take an active role. Women's organizations, though, have been doing a lot. I've been traveling a lot over the course of the last year, talking to various women's organizations that are usually progressive um, about how to convince more women to run for office. And there we're seeing major increases, but these are relatively small training programs. So, you know, they're getting more women to run for local positions. They're sometimes getting more women to run for county positions. But it's going to take a while for that local level office to generate interest in running for higher office. The Republicans seem to say that they want to recruit more women. They say that they want to close the gender gap, but instead they focus on one or two very high profile women and tout that as the new face of the party, which might be more effective, um, at least rhetorically. But then when you look at the numbers, you can't really make the case that there has been any widespread change. Okay, I'd like to turn to uh, the issue of competitiveness, competitiveness now. Um, if I understood you correctly, uh, you said that um, even uh, when uh, gerrymandering is being abolished, or partly abolished, uh, competitiveness will not improve dramatically. Um, then the question is, what can be done to improve more competitive races, to create more competitive races if gerrymandering is not the main problem? Does everybody know what gerrymandering is? Okay. More candidates. So part of the problem is that more than a third of candidates are not challenged in a primary ever. 
in the most, in the safest districts, it would be the primary where you could get real electoral competition. And then you've still got 30 or 40 districts where there's no, there's no challenger in the general election. There are a lot of districts that are heavily leaning toward one party or another, but it's possible that with the right candidate, you could make that race a little bit more competitive, which could potentially, should a candidate make a mistake, should a candidate be indicted on a felony, which is what we saw in, New, in one of the New York districts, lightning strikes and you wind up with a new candidate or a competitive race. And so I think what the parties need to start thinking about and what a lot of the organizations that recruit candidates have to start thinking about is maybe a second tier strategy where sure, they field their best candidates and they focus the majority of their resources in those very competitive seats. But they actually spend some time in the next 25 or the next 30 districts where should all of the stars align, there's a chance for a competitive election. Because only then can voters actually start following debates and discussions, and maybe then they'll start thinking a little bit differently. But in most media markets, for example, there's just no campaign happening. And without another candidate, it makes it, it, makes it very difficult. So are you actually saying that uh, competitiveness is not that much a problem if you include the primaries into the picture? Yeah. So that one of the best ways to get around the lack of competitiveness of the general election is to say, okay, this is a very, very lopsided district. This district has almost only Democrats or only Republicans living in it. That doesn't mean it doesn't have to be competitive. Let's have two good Republicans square off against each other. It's a Republican district, but that doesn't mean we're stuck with candidate A. The same thing could happen in a Democratic district. But we have very weak parties in the United States, and the parties hardly ever get involved in primaries. So it's not going to be the parties that decide to change the way these things work at the primary level. It would be up to independent groups or organizations that care about good elections and diversifying the candidate pool. Anyone? Okay. Now let's uh, continue with um, the situation uh, in Washington after the midterm elections. Or let's, let's start with sort of uh, um, saying, pointing out what the result of the midterm elections exactly mean. Um, apparently, the Republican victory was much larger than anyone had expected and predicted. Um, does that crea create its own new reality? Yes. So it's not only that the Republicans won pretty much every seat they had an opportunity to win at the congressional level. They also took over several state legislative houses. Republicans are now governors of Maryland and Massachusetts. No one was even thinking that Maryland was on the map. A Republican almost defeated an incumbent senator in Virginia in a race that no one thought was even competitive. And so this generated a kind of momentum that the Republicans will certainly try to ride into 2016. And it also showed that the Republicans learned the turnout game and they learned how to engage in the kind of grassroots mobilization efforts that the Democrats had always had an edge in. And so this changes the situation for 2016 because the Democrats cannot rest on their laurels and thinking, oh, well, we know how to win presidential elections. The Republicans learned what they did wrong in 2012 in terms of grassroots support and organizing for Mitt Romney. And 2014 was a good test for them to see if what they learned they could turn around. And every place that they tried and every place that they played, they won. Is it fair to say that as a result of the elections, the, the midterm elections, the Democratic Party is now the party that seems to be out of touch with uh, a large part of the electorate, while, let's say, a year ago, that that was the, the thing that was being said about the Republicans. So that I don't think is the case. Um, Barack Obama's numbers are going back up. Congressional, um, I'm sorry, national polls indicating a love affair with the Republicans never took hold. The Democrats and the Republicans are both uh, held in pretty low esteem, but the Republicans don't have a solid edge over the Democrats. I think the general sense is that elected officials are out of touch. And so it's up to each party right now to demonstrate that they get it more. But I don't think the Republicans go into 2016 with an edge on sort of what matters that much to the voters. I think a lot of this was a referendum on Obama and the Affordable Care Act still. So 
what should the Democrats do to show that they are not out of touch, that they get it? Well, these unemployment numbers, I, I can honestly say that I think this administration has a major communication problem. So unemployment is now 5.9%. That's really good, right? This is amazing given what economy Barack Obama inherited. The Republicans have said, no, this is not very good. So many people have stopped looking for work that they're not included. This is a fake number. Yes, the same way that it's a fake number always. But a fake number trend that goes down as much as it did is something that the Democrats should be touting. And they're not. So I think that whoever is the next candidate has an advantage because they get to take credit for the good things that this administration and the Democrats have done when they compare where we are now to where we were in 2008. And they get to distance themselves from the things that were not popular that this administration did. So I hope that if the Democrats you know, want to be competitive next time around, they do a better job highlighting their accomplishments and not allowing the Republicans to sort of write the narrative about how to interpret these accomplishments. The Republicans have gotten a lot better, I think, at doing that. But a different presidential candidate and a different set of Senate candidates might push back a little bit more than we saw in 2014. So are you saying that the Democratic candidate for 2016 should run on Barack Obama's record? should run on Democratic successes in the last eight years and completely distance herself from the, <laughs> from the Democratic failures. Um, I, I think that what, I don't know, a hypothetical candidate Hillary Clinton could do, for example, would be to say, look, when this administration took over in January of 2009, here were the numbers on a wide variety of indicators. Here are the numbers now. On the things that weren't popular, don't put them on the graph, right? Like, this is politics. It's spin. It's taking credit for what you want credit for. It's distancing yourself from what you want to distance yourself from. And it's the way the world works. I just don't think the Democrats do it very well. One of the problems is that for uh, Democrats, or at least for uh, many Democrats, um, health care reform is a success. But for the electorate, health care reform is, well generally a failure. So how, how, should, how should you position yourself vis-a-vis uh, -vis that, that issue? Well, the upside to having a little bit more time is that more and more Americans are going to actually have experienced their policies and using the Affordable Care Act. And at least according to public opinion polls, you know, not only are more and more people now insured and have millions of people successfully enrolled in the Affordable Care Act. Seven million. Not that many. I think it's 7.1, which exceeded the administration's goal. <laughs> I'm totally nonpartisan. <laughs> I'm here as a bipartisan. Um, I <laughs> Look, someone's got to give the administration talking points. Um, so, but I think that those numbers will continue to increase. And as more and more people use the program, they're going to find more and more people saying, oh, yeah, it's not that fundamentally different than what I was accustomed to or... I have coverage now that I didn't have. We don't need to survey and interview every single person to determine whether something's a success or not. But as you move further and further away from the website failure, for example, and you see more and more people now being able to get this kind of coverage, I think that assuming things continue in that direction, it will be far less of an issue in 2016 um, than it is now. Let, so let's, let's be clear about it. You don't think that the size of the Republican victory in November has created a new political situation in the United States? I think it has to the extent that it makes it virtually impossible for the Democrats to win back the Senate. Okay. So I think it makes it more likely that we're going to see gridlock and stymied policies for quite some time if the Democrats win the White House again because there will be divided government. But I don't think that the Republican victory tells us much about changing preferences of the American voters or whether one party now has any kind of major advantage that they did not have before. A lot of it was just bad geography for the Democrats and, uh, you know, the, the remainder of these polarized districts that were represented by the wrong party sorting themselves out. Okay. But you, what you're saying is that as far as presidential elections are concerned, demographic trends still favor the Democrats. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. And as long as the Democrats can get people out to vote the way that they have in the past, 
they'll still win. Remember that, you know, the Republican turnout machine, they demonstrated in Georgia, for example, that they could really turn out a lot of people and make sure that a Democratic candidate, Michelle Nunn, lost. The Democrats don't play in Georgia. So, you know, if you look at where the, the Democrats and the Republicans already have a lot of advantages, we're talking about maybe 10 states that the presidential election really occurs in. And those demographics in those states do favor the Democrats. It's just a matter of making sure that they can be turned out. Yeah. I, I was intrigued by an article that I read uh, a couple of months ago by uh, Joel Kotkin, who is an uh, expert in uh, urban politics. Um, and he said, he, he, he stressed the fact that the, the, the vast majority of Americans still live in single family homes in low uh, to mid density neighborhoods and, and they overwhelmingly uh, commute by car. They, they still really live a suburban life. They have a suburban lifestyle. And he said, well, um, uh, the, 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 the Democratic Party has, has apparently a very difficult time to, to convince those suburbanites to, uh, that, that, that they are really taking care of their concerns. So that is sort of an argument that runs counter to the demographic trends that you mentioned, that you stress. Is that correct? So, not necessarily, because a lot of these suburban areas where people are, even though, the, even though we're seeing increased um, volume in those areas, they're not necessarily in these swing states or in these swing districts. And so it's, you know, one of the interesting things about American politics is that we say we want to get voter turnout up, we say that it's important for everybody to engage, but really we care about a very, very small segment and whether they engage in a particular election year, in a particular state, or in a particular district. And so, so, I, so I don't know that those trends matter um, as much. The other thing is that the Democrats will always have more of an untapped resource in potential voters than the Republicans will because young people don't turn out to vote at the rates of older people. African Americans don't turn out to vote at the rates of whites. And those are two demographic groups that significantly favor the Democrats. So when the Democrats exert a lot of effort to turn on those groups to politics, they get disproportionate gains and successes. Latinos vote disproportionately. Two-thirds of them vote for the Democrats, sometimes even more. So the Democrats, in order to get their numbers up, have to rely on pretty unreliable voters, but voters that are already pre have a predisposition to support them. The Republicans, in order to get their numbers up, have to tap into a demographic group that's actually not predisposed to support them. So I think that those trends might cancel out some of the um, suburban flight that we're seeing. Do you think that Republicans will um, improve their, their options, their, their, their chances, uh, when they sort of would agree to some sort of immigration uh, uh, reform and then maybe try to tap into the Latino vote? So I think immigration reform is necessary but not sufficient. Um, so any Republican candidate that says, oh, we need it, I supported it, look, we got some version of it, that's the baseline requirement. The issue is then, okay, but now tell me why I should vote for you instead of the Democrat. Jeb Bush is pretty compelling on this. He, I recently read that he thinks in Spanish. So he speaks in Spanish at home and he claims that he actually thinks in Spanish. That's how, <laughs> that's how connected he is to the Latino community. Um, and so, you know, it's a strange statement to make, but I think a candidate like that actually has legitimacy uh, in a way that a lot of other candidates might not. It's not, I don't know if anybody remembers, but you know, like when Bill Clinton in 1992 was going around saying hola to people, it was just sort of like cringeworthy, right? <laughs> okay. Yes, Paul. I was um, struck by, you, Jennifer, you said that democratic, demographic trends still do favor the Democrats, yet at the same time I've heard that the weak performance of Obama will send a lot of young African-Americans uh, back to complete disinterest in politics. And you say that African-Americans traditionally have voted less than whites. So why do you think that demographic trends still favor the Democrats? 
because they just need to be mobilized. So the trends and the predisposition is there. Somebody needs to activate it, right? So it is predicated on a Democratic candidate being sufficiently compelling to make them leave the House and vote, even if it rains, But which is this very serious problem. Um, you want a sunny election day or else everything's a crapshoot. Um, but what happens is that you know, when you have a pretty boring candidate or somebody that's not trying to mobilize an under-mobilized constituency, they're not going to turn out. So, you know, that's what we saw in the midterms. What I will say about young people is that they are a growing portion of the electorate. Um, not, maybe not right now, but soon. So this is going to sound somewhat morbid, but you know, we talk about the old people who are the most reliable voters and the baby boomers. The baby boomers are getting old. Like, my parents are baby boomers. They're, like, my dad's 70. Like, that's not so young, right? The people older than them are going to die soon. And so, again, I don't mean this in a bad way, but there is going to be... <laughs> I mean it in the best way possible. But, but there is going to be generational replacement And so as the people that came of age supporting Democratic candidates like Bill Clinton or Barack Obama continue to age, that shifts the breakdown of the party affiliation and dispositions of a growingly reliable portion of the electorate as people get older. So even if not in 2016, over time, we might wind up seeing changes as well. Okay. Uh, before we started this meeting, you you told us over dinner about a new book that uh, you um, are going to publish next spring, coming spring in April, uh, uh, which concentrates or focuses to a large degree about the degree of political interest among younger voters, younger Americans. And um, what you found out was that that is really um, rather poor. Oh, it's, Tell it's, us a little bit it's about awful. This. So shocking. You're probably surprised that I have bad news. Um, <laughs> So Richard Fox and I wrote a book. It's called Running From Office, Why Young Americans Are Turned Off to Politics. And the general finding was that, you know, 90% of high school and college students have decided unequivocally that they would rather do anything else than run for office. And it doesn't matter how we ask these questions, right? So when we ask them, do you think that running for office is something you would ever like to do? 90% say, absolutely not. Do you think that running for office is in your future? 90% say, absolutely not. When we gave them 20 jobs and said, check off all that you might ever be interested in doing, mayor, state legislator, and member of Congress came in 17th, 18th, and 19th. The only thing that came in under that was plumber. Um, you, car salesmen literally came in above the three political positions. Uh, when we ask... If all of the following jobs paid the same amount of money, which do you find most appealing? Mayor is at the bottom of the list compared to teacher and business, business owner and, excuse me, um, salesperson. When we ask for higher echelon jobs, like school principal, lawyer, business executive, and member of Congress, member of Congress is at the bottom of the list. Both mayor and member of Congress were the most popular, least preferred option. And... What was interesting to us was that these findings cut across all demographic groups. Women and men did not want to run for office. Blacks, whites, and Latinos did not want to run for office. High school students and college students did not want to run for office. People that lived in the North, the South, the East, and the West did not want to run for office. Jews, Muslims, Christian evangelicals, Protestants, Catholics did not want to run for office. Democrats and Republicans did not want to run for office. It didn't matter what we did. So this, And the argument that we make in the book is that This disillusionment, this dysfunction, this gridlock that has come to characterize national politics is taking a toll beyond the inability to pass legislation. It's taking a toll beyond polling numbers that suggest that there are low levels of congressional approval. It's shaping an entire generation's attitudes toward entering the fray. These are kids that are very, very interested in engaging in public service, in volunteering in their communities, in highlighting their own sense of civic responsibility. They just think that electoral politics is not at all a means by which to achieve those ends. And as long as things like the government shut down, as long as infighting among and between members of Congress continue to highlight 
an inability to achieve anything and an inability to at least pretend to put constituents' interests first. There's nothing to suggest that this is going to change. We come up with at the end, this is very not me, the final chapter of the book are five suggestions for how to fix this problem. Um, and they're, we think, pretty creative solutions that completely circumvent members of Congress themselves, the media, just because we don't have much faith that things like that could change. But one of the things that we mention um, are video games. So these kids play a ridiculous number of hours of video games every week. Like, it's appalling. It's like seven or eight times the amount of hours they spend on homework. And they're proud to share this information with us. And so we did some analyses, and it turns out that a lot of the video games that they play require quite a bit of critical thinking and require, you know, are, are simulated scenarios that make them run cities or operate businesses. And, you know, it, there are a lot of sort of civic skills and political skills that they could be acquiring through this. But when we looked at political video games, there was like nothing out there that had the kind of infrastructure, the kind of graphics, the kind of interface that would make them at all interesting, right? But imagine a video game where you get to choose whether you're the Democratic or the Republican candidate. And then along the way, you have to make choices like you find out that your opponent's wife had an affair. Do you put that in your campaign ad? A lobbyist tries to bribe you. Do you take the money, right? All of these kinds of challenges. And if you answer the normatively attractive way, you proceed, right? So. It would be one way to try and let young people realize that politics also involves a lot of decision making and is kind of fun and is something that we should just be thinking about regularly. And it doesn't only have to emphasize the terrible things, right? You could have a debate about different positions on a bill. There are lots of opportunities, but we just don't think about politics as sort of like a sexy way to engage people because it's not seen as a noble profession. You know, the example that I always give is when there was and there still are, but it's gotten better, when there were significant um, examples of underrepresentation of women in the math and science professions across the world, there was a global outcry, right? That we needed more women to um, get involved in these professions because we needed to leverage and marshal all the human capital we could. We've never seen an outcry like that for women or even for men to run for office because we say things like, oh, well, why would they want to waste their time doing that? They have real potential. Or why would I want my child to do that? It would be terrible and it would be an awful invasion of privacy. We don't hold it in high regard at all. And public opinion polls suggest, you know, not only that Congress is unpopular, but when people are asked to rank the ethics and integrity of people in a variety of different professions, politicians come in at the bottom of the list. The only people that fare worse are lobbyists. And so, many of whom are former politicians. And so, you know, until we start to make young people realize that politics can be fun and you can accomplish stuff, I don't think that we've got much hope moving forward. But I don't know, video games seem to be the wave of the future, so I'm jumping on the bandwagon. I, ca I can't help wondering whether um, politics or public office in general is held in much higher esteem here in the Netherlands or in Europe in general. But that's just uh, a question, I don't know. Uh, let's go back to um, the way Washington works and works right now after the midterm elections with a Republican majority in Congress and a Democrat in the White House. You said, well, um, we'll, we'll, we can expect Barack Obama to, ve to veto more bills because um, this is his last term. He doesn't have to worry about re-election. Um, but maybe he will be restrained by the fact that he will be held responsible to a certain degree for uh, who will succeed him, a Democrat or a Republican. So that may uh, restrain him after all. Isn't that true? Uh, so it's hard to imagine the scenario under which he would not veto something because, especially for the next, let's say, six months, because it could potentially hurt an, un, an as yet unnamed Democratic nominee running against we don't know whom. So I could see very close to the election um, you know, in the fall of next uh, in the fall of 2016, for example, more restraint if it looks like it could actually something could play poorly in swing states. But I think that for the next six months or so, similar to the way that he's demonstrated a willingness to use executive orders, 
he's going to do everything he can to make sure that any progressive movement that he's been able to make over the, la the last six years will not be completely counteracted by a few months of um, you know, Republican control in both the House and the Senate. I, I, just, I just don't think that um, him not vetoing something, I, I just don't see him being constrained and potentially um, affecting his own legacy because of his concern about the next nominee. Not this early. A year and a half from now, maybe. Does that mean that you think that we'll now see the really progressive Obama? So I think the really progressive Obama was a figment of a lot of people's imaginations. <laughs> um, I think we're going to see a more progressive Obama. But, I mean, this is not... I, you know, he, he's done a lot of the progressive things that, he's, uh, that he said he was going to do. Um, I don't think we're going to see anything absolutely incredible. But I do think we're going to see him stop legislation or try to fight legislation that would clearly move the country in a very conservative direction. Um, you know, but I, I don't think that we're going to see anything that's totally unexpected. If you, if you would have to rate uh, uh, his presidency, what, what, would, what would you say over the past six years? Hmm? So, I, so I would give them like a C minus on messaging, but an A on legislative accomplishments. It's hard, especially with a Congress that has been the least willing to do work, right? The, the previous Congress praised itself because it was only the second to last, to most ineffective Congress in history. The one before that had been the most, so we had seen major improvement. Um, I mean, what he was able to get done, when you think about TARP, when you think about the economy and the unemployment rate, when you think about the Affordable Care Act, when you think about um, banking reform, these were all very significant legislative accomplishments. Some of them are unpopular, but in a lot of ways that makes it even more remarkable that he was able to achieve these legislative accomplishments. Um, so I, I actually, I mean, look, it's shocking to you, I'm a liberal Democrat, but I think he's done a pretty good job. Okay, I saw a hand here. <clears throat> So um, I come from a generation um, where my parents were actually very involved in um, the Voting Rights Act, and um, I wondered if you had seen the movie Selma and what your um, sort of prediction of some of the restrictions on voter registration might have with this new, uh, the results of the midterm election. So I haven't seen the movie yet, um, although I plan to soon. That was a, so voting rights restrictions I think, um, I don't know if they ultimately accounted for many specific outcomes, but they certainly shaped margins in 2014. Um, and I think we can expect to see the same thing in 2016 unless, um, unless there's change. Um, I think that's going to be one of the biggest messages that the Democrats um, focus on. I think that we're going to see unprecedented efforts on election day 2016 to ensure that every single vote is counted. Um, and I think we're going to see heightened education efforts directed at people who might be affected by some of these new restrictions to ensure that for them turning out to vote is as easy as it ordinarily would be. And so I wouldn't be surprised if in the states, for example, that have cut down the number of days of early voting or that now have these voter ID laws, that that's where the Democrats will be deploying people to ensure that it doesn't affect the outcomes because it did affect the margins in 2014. Um, and in terms of sort of like legislative outcomes to change these kinds of things, I think that's going to take longer. Um, but at least as a political reality, the Democrats can do a lot to fight it with manpower on election day and leading up to it, woman power, people power. Okay. We were no longer talking about women in politics, so I didn't know if I was allowed to use the word. Okay. There's a question over here. I, do you think that Democrats in 2016 have an opportunity to retake the Senate because a couple of Republicans will have to defend uh, typically Democratic states and, so to speak, correct the map this time in favor of the Democrats? So two months ago, or I guess two and a half months ago, I would have said yes. I would have said, don't worry about it. The Republicans are going to gain control, and then the Democrats are going to get it back. I am an eternal pessimist, and I never thought that the Republicans would have taken as many seats as they did. So even with favorable geography for the Democrats in 2016, it doesn't look like there's enough 
um, for, there's enough to certainly close the gap, but I don't think there's enough to take back control. Okay. Do you think uh, Hillary Clinton will have a woman as a running mate? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I, um, I think that the notion of a female president and a female vice president would become the only thing anybody's talking about and it would take away from the actual debate about who to elect as president. It would just seem like such a strange thing um, that, that I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know that the media or the voters would actually know what to do. And, and I, I think that when you're running for office and when you're campaigning, you hope that there's at least some substantive discussion. I would not be surprised if the Republicans did. Right, so if the Republicans had a vice president, I don't know who she would be, um, but if there are some options, but if the Republicans had a vice presidential running mate and Hillary Clinton's the nominee, then that's kind of interesting because it means that regardless of the outcome, a major glass ceiling was broken. Are you actually excited about the prospect of uh, uh, Hillary Clinton as the Democratic nominee? Personally? Yes. So it's funny, I'll, I'll out myself. I was not a Hillary person in 2008. It's even worse than that. I was a John Edwards person in 2008. Ooh. I know, I'm a terrible judge of character. Um, Talking about dissolution. <laughs> and, and then I became a Barack Obama person. Um, my views toward Hillary Clinton now are so much more positive than they were then. And I think, it's, I think that's the case for a lot of people, in part because of how she served um, in the administration when she was in it, but also because... You know, in 2008, history was going to be made on the Democratic side of the aisle, regardless of whether Obama or Clinton garnered the nomination. And I think everybody felt good about the outcome because this was something that no one would have expected even a few years before. And I now feel that about Hillary Clinton. Like, I can already tell there was this... I, like, I'll cry all the time, I'm sure, because there was this... Um, commercial, this political ad for Alison Lundgren Grimes, who was running against Mitch McConnell in Kentucky. And the ad was very, very straightforward. It was just seven or eight Democratic female senators. And they all, in a row, just said, come on, Allison, you can do it. Break the glass ceiling. Anyway, I'm showing this to my class. They're completely bored, and I'm literally bawling. <laughs> and so, and I don't even know why it resonated the way that it did, but it was just this incredibly powerful message. And so I, yes, I'm... I'm going to be excited. First over there. <laughs> New face. I'm going to ask the question probably everybody in the room wants to ask you, which is, put your money on the table. Who's the tickets, both sides, right now? So Hillary Clinton will be on the Democratic side. I really don't know who her running mate would be. I, I mean, I really have absolutely no idea. On the Republican side, if the election were held now and nothing crazy happens between now and then, I think Jeb Bush is the nominee. Um, and I think it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility to have somebody like Kelly Ayotte, who's the female senator from New Hampshire on the ticket. Um, but So the vice presidential picks are a little bit trickier because they're contingent on who the other party's nominee is. Right, so for example, if Hillary Clinton chose not to run, I think the Republicans would have far less of an incentive to diversify their own ticket. Um, and I also think that the Democrats would be far more inclined to seek out a female vice presidential nominee. But I can't imagine that Clinton's not going to run. And, I mean, a Clinton-Bush race, I would say, is what we're probably going to see, which is kind of just unbelievable to me. Okay. Okay. I have a question via Twitter. Uh, this is a question from Marjolein Monen. I Twittered your interesting observations about how people, when it's about local initiatives that they can vote for themselves, such as recreational marijuana, uh, 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 choice, all the other issues, vote actually more progressively, but then go ahead and vote on a national level for Republicans. And she says, really? So why do they vote for them and not for the Democrats? Well, a couple of reasons. One is that it's not necessarily um, uh, it's not necessarily that they know about this disconnect, right? And so a lot of the time, people are not that attentive to politics. And we have motivated reasoning. So we tend to think that 
the way we feel about issues is the way people in our party must feel about issues. Or the, if, so an independent voter, for example, who's very progressive on these issues, might think, oh, I like this Republican candidate because of some other issue. I don't know what he thinks about these other things, but he seems good enough. Right, so it's not that there are strong partisans who are voting one way on a set of policy issues and then another way for their candidates. It's these independent voters or these swing voters who, when push comes to shove, are a little bit more progressive on the issues, but when they have to choose between a pretty conservative Republican and what sometimes is a more moderate Democrat than they would like, go with the Democrat. What also happened in 2014 was that Barack Obama was very unpopular, and nationally, the Republicans did a better job suggesting that the Democrats are the reason that the United States has gone to hell in a handbasket. And so it made it pretty easy for people to say, oh, I support initiatives A, B, and C, and I care about the future of the country, so that must mean that I also support Republican candidate X. Um, and so it's not that there are these internal inconsistencies among people that are very politically sophisticated and who are following the news all the time. It's the people that are more in the middle and can actually swing from one election to the next where we see, um, where we see some inconsistency. Okay. Just had a question about the media. Um, in your findings, you talked about how the media covers equally male and female candidates. Um, did you find at all that the media was harsher on female candidates? And is that also maybe a reason possibly why young people don't want to run, that the media is so overblown and you do one thing and it's, you know, the next second it's all over the world, a photo, for example? <laughs> That's true at the presidential level and probably in some very, very high-profile Senate races. It's just not the case for the overwhelming majority of elected positions. So in the United States, there are 520,000 elected offices. Um, for about 515,000 of them, there will never be any media coverage whatsoever. Uh, for the rest, it will be very minimal. What we did was we looked at all of the local newspaper articles covering congressional candidates in 2010 and 2014 in the month before the presidential election, because local newspapers is still where people are getting their information about congressional candidates. And it didn't matter how we looked at the data. In terms of whether candidates were described using traditionally male traits like leadership and competence, male and female candidates were equally likely to garner those mentions. Female traits like empathy and integrity, same thing. In fact, we coded for more than 100 different traits and we uncovered nothing. We did the same thing for about 175 different issues and uncovered nothing. Women and men were associated with the same issues, either as having competence or not. And we also coded gender mentions. We thought, well, maybe this is the case, but women are more likely to be talked about as women or as mothers or as wives or their appearance was going to be mentioned or their family background would be mentioned. And 97% of the articles we coded had no mention of any of those things. And the 3% that did were equally likely to be describing a male and a female candidate. And so the good news is that even if overall coverage has sort of become a little bit crummier, that's a technical term, or more superficial or less substantive, um, an upside to that, and maybe an upside to party polarization, where what we really care about is the party label, is that whether you're a man or a woman running just isn't that interesting and just isn't that important. Now, it does affect, we think, women's perceptions because the stories that do get covered all the time are stories of clear bias against female candidates. So the way that Hillary Clinton was treated when she ran for president becomes the lens through which people assess whether they could run for school board member. It's not going to happen. I ran for Congress. I would have been thrilled if the media were in my trash. Right? That means it's a competitive race. And so, but we don't tend to think about things that way. So I think letting people know that most of these races get no coverage 
And the ones that do are getting pretty equitable coverage would go a long way. Overall, we found that um, in 2010, for example, the average house race um, had about 14 newspaper articles written about it in the month leading up to election day. So that's great. That's one every other day. But that was driven by the most competitive races, which saw often multiple articles every day. So, you know, most of these races still are only getting maybe 10 mentions over the course of an entire campaign. Um, if if uh, Hillary Clinton uh, indeed wins the uh, Democratic nom nomination and Jeb, uh, Jeb Bush uh, the Republican nomination, aren't you afraid that the campaign in 2016 will feel as, a, as the rerun of an old show? So this is where I feel old. I asked my students that and they were like, huh? <laughs> like, they have no idea what 1992 even was. So um, I, no, and these are two new candidates at least, right? So it's not the same thing as Bill Clinton running against the first George Bush or I, I think it'll be a little bit fresher. Um, but I mean, sure, it's not necessarily this, it's not Barack Obama, right? It's not some new candidate that has emerged from the roadwork who's going to rising star. Um, maybe we're okay with sort of same oldish. Yes, but at least in uh, both in 2000, yeah, in 2008, uh, on the Democratic s side, it was an exciting race because there were a, a, a woman, uh, the first woman who had a real chance for uh, on the, uh, to, to to win the nomination, and the first African American candidate uh, on the national scale. So that that was something special. Um, and then there was a, a also an, a rather interesting race between uh, Obama and a well-respected senator on the Republican side. That, that is not the case when uh, Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush will face off. That, 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 that kind of excitement, you can simply not expect it. So I think the excitement of a female presidential nominee in a general election is going to be more than um, what we might expect. I, I do think that there's going to be a general sense of, oh my gosh, like this could actually happen this time. With the primaries, you know, she would have still needed to get through the general election, and that was not a foregone conclusion at that point either. So it was one necessary step, but that wasn't going to be the end game. So I do think that there will be a sense of enthusiasm. Um, and then, you know, I also think that what could potentially make the race somewhat interesting is the family members of the candidates in question who will unquestionably play a role in the campaign, right? Bill Clinton cannot restrain himself. Um, <laughs> And George Bush has been trying, you know, he's been saying things like, oh, I don't know, like, let him do whatever he wants. Chances are he's going to say a little bit more, too. And so I do think there's going to be this strange dynamic where you've got previous presidents on the campaign trail, um, which is kind of it, previous presidents who now claim that they're very close friends. Um, you know, and, and so I think that that will be I, I think that that could be somewhat interesting. Crazy. Oh, okay, all right. Over there, sorry. Um, just, just getting back for a second to perceptions and why more women don't run. Is your study specific to American culture? Have you done any cross-cultural studies? And if it is particularly American, do you have any idea why? There, I haven't done cross-cultural research, so my focus is exclusively women in U.S. politics. There are a lot of political scientists that look at variation across countries to try and explain why some nations have 45% women in the legislature and some have 20%, right? If it's just an ambition story, that wouldn't make much sense. Why would you see the variation? And so the variation cross-nationally is often accounted for by electoral rules and structures. So most of the nations that are in the top 30 have quotas of some type. Most of the nations in the top 50 have party list systems or proportional representation, right? That facilitates the emergence of female candidates. Our research, though, I do think transports into different nations because it explains the variation in levels of representation within that country, right? And so for us, given the confines of any set of elections in the U.S., you know, a very entrepreneurial candidate emergence process with weak parties, it's these individual factors about emerging as a candidate that are the most relevant, right? So any electoral system similar to the United States, I would expect, if there's underrepresentation of women, that it's this political ambition story. 
in states that have greater numbers, I think it's probably still the case that you would find this gender gap in political ambition, but there are electoral rules and structures that mitigate it. We just don't have anything to close that gap. You know, somebody said recently, well, do you mean to tell me that, you know, there aren't enough ambitious women to run for office? No, there are. No one's asking them, right? But so if you have a structure where the party says, I'm going to go out and find 218 women this time to run for Congress, chances are we would see a major jump in the number of women running. Women can still be far less politically ambitious than men, but we can find 218 of them, right? So I do think that these patterns um, are particularly interesting and important when looked at within the confines of any one set of electoral rules. Okay, well, this session uh, is coming to an end. Um, I think, um, thank you very much for all your observations, sometimes positive, sometimes a little discouraging. <laughs> but as you suggested that you yourself still consider running again, maybe in the future, at least your own conviction uh, apparently is that there's still hope for American politics. It is, and people say to me all the time, well, aren't you happy you lost? Wouldn't you, aren't you happy you don't have to be among those people? No. <laughs> well, and as far as your predictions uh, are concerned, um, let's say we hope to welcome you again, uh, let's say in the spring of 2016, and when uh, Mike Huckabee is then the Republican candidate <laughs> and Elizabeth Warren is the Democratic candidate, you'll have to face new, a new set of questions. I will eat crow, okay. I promise. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I think we all, well, I certainly learned a lot. Thank you, Jennifer, and very exciting. And your grip of the statistics and the data is so impressive. Um, please follow us on Twitter, John Adams NL, on Facebook. Sign up for our newsletter and make sure to download our blog, which will be of heightened interest to you after this evening. Uh, nation to, a nation torn, including the blog of uh, Paul Brill. Uh, Jennifer will be signing her last book downstairs, and in April, her book, Running From Office, will appear. I'm sure we're all looking forward to it. Our next event is on February 26th with Bill Browder, who started out being one of, being the largest foreign investor in Russia until he ran afoul of Vladimir Putin. He is now persona non grata and has devoted his life and his new book, um, to trying to get justice for his lawyer who was killed in prison in Russia. It's an exciting and scary story, and I'm sure he'll be a very powerful speaker on January, um, excuse me, February 26th at the Onselkerk. Thank you for being with us here this evening, and let's go downstairs and have a drink. <laughs>